what's going on everyone welcome back to this video today we're going to talk about intrusion detection and prevention systems so what is on the to today's video agenda first we're going to provide an introduction to both IDS and IPS next we're going to talk about how they work okay and next we're going to take examples of products that are considered IDS slash IPS and lastly we're going to talk about how to evade IDS products or evasion techniques now to be honest this video will be focused on this item on the agenda why though because we have covered before um, snort and uh, other IDS products I'm gonna put the links of these videos in the video description you can get back to them if you want to learn more about how IDS and IPS work in details all right so first let's start with the introduction so IDS stands for intrusion okay D for detection And of course, the S for system. Now, the P here stands for prevention. Prevention. So it is intrusion detection system or intrusion prevention system. So what is the use case of intrusion detection system or prevention system? So basically, uh, consider this scenario. You have a network here. Let's say you have uh, PC1 and you have server. Okay, and then you have a switch here, and after the switch you have a router, and let's say here we have a firewall along the way. Okay, so PC1 is connected to switch, and the server is connected to the switch, the switch is connected to the firewall, and then the firewall is connected to the router. And then you have the cloud here. So usually, the router regulates the flow of the incoming and outgoing traffic. So you can see here the traffic coming in, and if the PC1 on the server, you know, require internet connection, of course, so the traffic here comes out. So this is out going, and this is incoming. Okay, so the firewall does the job in regulating the traffic and in some cases there is the next generation firewalls next generation firewalls these days they act as IPS or IDS intrusion detection and prevention systems now let's say you want to deploy an IDS or IPS so in this case you have to consider the operating modes of an IDS so before deciding whether you need an IDS or IPS in your network, you have to consider the differences. So the IDS only alerts, creates alerts. It doesn't drop the malicious packets. The IPS can be configured to alert plus you, you actually you choose an action when a rule matches so you either choose to drop the packet you can choose to block the connection or you can choose to log okay now in the case of IDS the IDS creates alerts and you can choose an action the available action is to log the packet that's the main difference or the highlight between IDS and the IPS all right, so let's come back here to this scenario. Okay, so here we have the firewall, okay? Now, if we want to deploy an IDS, it's better to deploy an IDS and install the IDS on the computer, let's say it is PC3, okay? And connect it to the switch. This way, the IDS can um, have full visibility on the traffic coming to the switch 
okay, and can then create the alerts if a rule matches. We're going to talk about the rules. Now, if you want to deploy an IPS, you have to consider the operating mode here. So you want the IDS to block the malicious data, the traffic you want to drop or you want to lock. It depends on the action, but, but most of the time, the IPS should be deployed in what is called the inline mode. So what is the inline mode here? In our scenario, the inline mode can actually be deployed by connecting the IPS directly behind between the firewall and the switch. So that's the inline here. Oh, can I do this one more time? Here. So here goes the inline IPS. We call it network intrusion prevention system. That's where its position comes if you want to deploy it in a network. Now, there are two types of IDS or IPS. First, we have the H IDS, and we have the other one, NIDS. <coughs> now, the H stands for the host, host intrusion detection system, and the N stands for network. So it becomes network intrusion detection system. What's the main difference here? Now, the HIDS is host-based. So what does that mean? It means that it is installed on one computer, one OS, okay? On the other hand, or however, the network intrusion detection system is dedicated appliance. I'm gonna call it dedicated appliance. Now it could be actually hardware appliance, okay, or it can be a dedicated server. Let's go back with the examples here. So here, let's choose a different color. So remember the server here in our network. You can dedicate the server as a network intrusion detection system. You install a Snort or a Wazoo. So here you can have Snort or you can have Wazoo. And then you're going to change the server's position in the network diagram. You're going to have to move the server somehow uh, to be here between the switch and the firewall, or you can just um, you know, connected directly to a dedicated port in the switch so that it acts as a network intrusion detection system. It has full visibility over the uh, network packets or the network activity. So coming back to the difference between HIDS and NIDS, the first difference or the first thing to remember is that HIDS is host-based and NIDS is actually, it can be dedicated appliance or or can be server-based. The other important difference is that the HIDS has only visibility over the host that it is installed on. So it is host visibility. Meaning it can only inspect the traffic coming through or coming to or off the host. It's installed on. However, Network intrusion detection system is its network visibility. So it has a visibility over the entire network packets, much like a firewall. Now let's discuss detection modes. So in detection modes, we're gonna explain how intrusion detection system or an intrusion prevention system detects malicious traffic okay so we have two operating modes or the engine let's we're gonna call it the detection engine here it can be signature based or it can be anomaly based it follows the same logic of an antivirus remember an antivirus has a database of signatures, right? So if a file, if a file signature matches one of the signatures of the database, 
the AV triggers an alert. The same here in intrusion detection or prevention systems. If it was signature based, then uh, it will actually rely on a signature or a database of signatures where it compares the traffic that it encounters on the network to the actual to the actual uh, data it has on the database. If there is a match, it will create an alert. Now, in the anomaly paste here, the idea should have knowledge of what a normal traffic looks like. So here, what we do, we train the intrusion detection system. We give it regular normal data. This can be achieved through manual rules. Okay. Or we can use AI. So using manual rules or artificial intelligence, we can tell the intrusion detection system what is normal, what can be normal, normal traffic. And then when the IDS detects or encounters traffic that's different from what it has learned in the past or what we trained it in the past, it's going to, ra to raise an alert. That's the main difference between signature based and anomaly based. Okay, next, the rules. Now, the rules are the core of every IDS product. Without rules, there is no IDS. So, that's what constitutes or that's what forms the behavior of an IDS. We create actually rules. In the rules, we tell the IDS what to do and what not to do. Let's take an example here. So, Snort. As you know, it is an intrusion detection system. Now, when we want to configure SNORT, we will want to configure the rules. Usually, SNORT rules are located under this directory. Okay. Now, in that directory, SNORT rules are stored there by default. We can find all the uh, pre-built or pre-configured rules. However, if you don't want to use the default rules, you can create your own rule file and then invoke it while uh, you start SNORT with this option dash c your rule file okay let's talk about the rule structure in snort now uh, as you can see guys snort is an example here of an ids and it depends on the ids product or type the rule structure may be different for example in the case of snort the rule consists of rule header and rule options now every component has its own parts for example the rule header here has these components, the action, the alert, the protocol, the direction. And lastly, we can see the destination IP and the port. Now, basically, without digging into much details, let's take an example rule in Snort and explain it. Because this will take a lot of time to, to go through. We're going to just take an example rule. So that's an example rule you would create in a Snort rule file. You can see we start with the action here. The action, the, the default action for an RDS is alert. Okay, so basically we want to actually alert if this rule matches. Next, we decide the protocol. In this case, it's an ICMP rule. Source IP, source port, and then we have destination IP and destination port. That is the direction of the flow. Okay. Now, this is bi-directional traffic, meaning coming to and from the network. And here, lastly, we have the message. So between two parentheses, we can define certain parameters, such as the message that we want to see if the rule is triggered. For example, if when you deploy Snort and you create this rule in your rule file, now Snort will start to inspect packets, right? If Snort detects an ICMP packet, Okay, matching these parameters, it will uh, alert or create an alert. The alert message will be ICMP packet found. This is this ID, and here are other parameters that you can also configure. Another example would be here. Now, this ID is actually identifier that needs to be different with every rule you create or every line. For every rule, you create different SID. Okay, here's another example. Here, the difference is the source IP. Again, it's bi-directional. 
So he triggers alerts on ICMP traffic originating from the network to any destination. As you can see, guys, we can specify a network instead of an IP address. So another example would be inspecting FTP traffic. As I said earlier, guys, we can control the protocol here. So this one should be an IP protocol. Okay. Here it's ICMP. Here it's a network protocol, TCP or UDP. So here we can create an alert such as alert, TCP, any, any. And look at this. This is one direction only, meaning originating from the, uh, from the network, local network, because the source is any, okay, meaning any device or an endpoint on the network. With this direction, okay, meaning we want to inspect traffic or this rule will apply on traffic originating from any host inside the network where the protocol is TCP. Okay, let's continue further. Now the destination here, any IP address and port is 21, meaning we are inspecting traffic originating from the uh, local endpoints or local clients on my machine, targeting FTP servers on the web, meaning we are inspecting FTP traffic. Okay, between two parentheses here, we have, as I said earlier, with options to configure various parameters, such as the message and the content. The content here, signifies uh, the payload. The payload is the data contained within the packets. So when I use content here, meaning I want to inspect the payloads, the, 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 the payload in the packet, the contents of the packets. So the, here the content equals to anonymous, as you can see, the word anonymous. So meaning I want to check if the FTP packets contain the word anonymous, meaning I'm looking for indications of an anonymous login. So that's why the message here, FTP anonymous login found. Let's see another example. Okay, here we can also detect or, you know, inspect HTTP uh, protocol. Let's see an example. Alert TCP, okay. Now, this rule inspects traffic originating from an entire network. And here, it is bidirectional, meaning originating from the network and coming to the network. As you can see, the destination is port 80, meaning I'm inspecting HTTP traffic. Uh, the message is HTTP packet found, SID, and the revision. So this is a general rule to inspect or to detect HTTP traffic. So these are example rules of Snort IDS. Okay, what Zoo IDS is different uh, than Snort is in that it contains a GUI interface. Okay, I don't have now uh, ready access to a Wazoo. I'm just demonstrating with the screenshots. So thing is, in Wazoo, you have a central GUI interface, central server, and then you have what's called agents. You can deploy agents to endpoints to be able to monitor them. As you can see here, Wazoo can be configured to perform vulnerability scanning, auditing, and also Wazoo operates on rules. Okay, it follows the same concept as Snort. It needs rules. There is no escape. You have to use rules. Okay, these were examples of IDS products. And remember, an IDS can turn into an IPS once I configure an action to drop or log or block the packet in addition to the uh, the mode of operation remember we have inline and we have uh, basic mode let's talk about evasion first let's understand why do you need or why sometimes you need to evade an IDS thing is let's go back to the cyber kill chain remember when you start your red team engagement or when you start pen testing, you will go through the cyber kill chain phases. You start with the re recon, right? And then you go to weaponization, then delivery, and then installation, and then actions on objectives. Okay, 
Now, during the reconnaissance, you may need to conduct OSINT. You may need to do port scanning, right? Uh, we're going to skip this. Delivery and... Yeah, to the delivery here. You might deliver your payload through reverse shell. Right. And we're going to skip an installation for now. Actions on objective. Some of your... Uh, depending on the engagement, you might need at the end to exfil trade data. Data exfil. Smuggling data to your servers. Or simply you might need to cause ransomware infection, right? Now, this is not applicable for the evasion tactics of an IDS. Let's talk about the three important aspects uh, in the cyber kill chain in which you might need to evade an IDS. The first one is port scanning. So, during port scanning, you might actually encounter firewall, right? So that when you scan the target with nmap, you're going to have zero results. This could be to, due to the presence of firewall or even an IDS. Okay, in the case of reverse shell, you might be trying to create a reverse shell or even <coughs> a bind shell to get access to your target. Thing is, if there is an IDS, it's going to alert the blue team and probably it's going to log or drop the connection. So here you also need to evade the IDS. And lastly, in the XFIL data, the IDS or IPS might be configured to block certain protocols such as maybe DNS in certain areas or in certain uh, packets. So if you use DNS to exfiltrate the data, the IDS will notice the attempt, it will alert the blue team and block the connection if it was configured to be an IPS. So now let's talk about the evasion tactics. The first tactics in the evasion, so what we might need to do, we might need to use different protocol. Use different protocol. Now, using different protocol might be most beneficial for data exfil and in the delivery phase. So how is that? Okay. So usually, let's take, let's take an example. We have a tool, Netcut. So Netcut has client and server. So let's say on your attacker machine, you have attacker machine here, and you have victim. So on the attacker machine, you would go ahead and say nc l nvp and listen on port maybe 4545. Now on the victim machine, what you would do once you get access, you will use nc, your IP address of the attacker, and the port 4545. And then you will establish the connection. Thing is, Netcat uses TCP by default. Okay, sometimes an IDS will, will raise an alert. So what you might need to do here, in this example, you might need to switch. So in, instead of using TCP, you would use UDP. So how would you, would you do that with Netcat? you would need to use only one option. So this command will become with UDB here NC dash and then you would use U and you would complete the rest of the command L, V and P okay. and you would cho choose a port maybe the same port Likewise, on the attacker machine, or on the victim machine, you would type N, C, okay, and then dash U, to use UTP, the IP address of the attacker machine, and the port number. This method, we use UDP instead of TCP, and the connection might go unnoticed. This is also useful for data exfil. 
So remember that in Netcat we can transfer data using the key arrows here. We can put a file, the text, and transfer it between uh, the victim and the client or the victim on the attacker machine. I'm not going to talk about this because we already covered this many times, but we can also transfer the file using the UDP protocol. So that's an example of changing protocol to evade the IDS. The other tactic is changing the source port in your connection. So what does that mean? Let's remember that IDS, IPS, and even firewalls, they recognize traffic and the type of service or type of packet used depending on the port number. So if the packet has port number of 22, it means this is an SSH packet. If it has port 53, it means it's a DNS packet. If it is 80, the port number is 80, it means it's HTTP traffic. Now the firewall might be trained or configured to allow these, uh, to allow traffic with these ports, or even IDS might be trained to consider these packets as normal packets, P9 packets, not malicious packets. So, well, we want to take advantage of this. So instead of using these ports, 4545 and maliciously looking ports, we will want to switch to these ports because they are allowed or considered normal in the network by the IDS. But how do we do so? Okay. So, yeah. So remember, this tactic can be used for both um, data exfil and can be used to scan ports. Let's explain both scenarios. So we start with the port scanning. Now, usually when we scan a target with Nmap, we choose a type of scan, UDP, TCP, stealth scan, server scan, so on and so forth. What if I want my scan okay, to use a specific port so that I trick the IDS or the firewall that the traffic I am sending is originating from a P9 port, such as 80 or 53? How can I do that? I can use Nmap. Okay and you would choose the type of scan it could be stealth scan and then use the option dash g and then you could use port 80 and here the ip address of the attacker machine so what does that mean it means that i'm instructing nmap to make the traffic originating from my machine as it is an http traffic now when the ids inspects the Nmap packets, it will actually see that the packets are originating from port 80, which means that the IDS will think, oh, this is a H2 packet. Okay, I'm gonna allow it, or I'm gonna, I'm not gonna alert or create an alert for the blue team. So that's the thing here. So we can pass port scanning as a normal HTTP traffic. We can do the same here using dns so instead we can apply the same command but instead of dash g80 we can use dash g53 but be careful because you have to align the port number with the scan type so here this is a stealth scan but remember it's tcp scan when you want to use uh, port 53 remember that it is a udp port so you have to adjust your scan accordingly this means that the dash s is going to be dash s u this time you are doing udp scan and the ids will think this is a dns packet this way your port scanning will go unnoticed you can even use this to maybe to evade firewalls i haven't tried it but you may consider to try now let's talk about the case of data exfiltration Remember guys, that takes fill or even uh, the installation phase, delivery phase. Delivering reverse shells or bind shells. Okay, so let's go back to the example of using netcut. Remember that we have attacker and we have victim. Okay, 
So on the attacker, we would go ahead and create a listener. If we want to use a port to trick the IDS that this is a regular allowed traffic, we will want to configure the port. So NC, okay, and then let's say I want to use port 53. So I would use dash U first because I want Netcat to use UDP protocol. So U, L, V, and P, and then the port here will be 53. Likewise, on the victim machine now, I would go ahead and connect to my listener. So netcat dash U, okay, the IP address of the attacker machine, and here comes the port. This is a DNS traffic. It will look like a DNS traffic. Next, we have fragmentation. Thing is, fragmentation can be used to evade firewalls and IDS. But guess what? We have to remember that we have to know where every tactic can be applied. So fragmentation can be applied in port scanning to give you meaningful results. You don't want to get zero results and you don't want to get ports which are all filtered where there is no details about the servers running on these ports. So we want to use fragmentation. To give you a clear example of fragmentation, let's head to the notes. And here I'm gonna search for Okay, so in fragmentation, we actually divide the packet into smaller packets using the option dash F. Okay, so adding another, so here dash F will spl uh, splice the packet, but double F will split the data into 16 byte fragments. So here what we are doing, go back here, we have, uh, let's say, a packet with patterns of maybe uh, DNS okay now when we split the packet or when we use nmap dash f and then the IP address of the scan the target the packet here will be split into multiple packets with 8 byte size okay now the IDS when it inspects the packet it will see the fragments coming in so it's going to inspect the fragments one by one. At the end, it won't recognize the actual real pattern of your packets. Therefore, most probably, it's not gonna trigger any alert. Likewise with the firewall. All you have to do is to use the option dash F in your Nmap scan. Similar to fragmentation, there is invalid packets. Meaning we sent an invalid packet, not correctly uh, recognized packet. Again, this can be used to evade firewalls and to evade IDS. Where? During or during Nmap scanning. Meaningful for port scans. So same here, guys. Let's go back to the case of nmap. So nmap, okay, and then we can use an option dash dash bad sum. So here we set an invalid checksum of the TCP. So dash dash bad sum, we can configure TCP slash UDP checksum. There is another option which is dash dash scan flags. Dash dash scan flags lets us configure the TCP flags. Remember, we have many TCP flags such as the reset flag, the sync flag. If you know what is TCP, the three way handshake, you will know what I'm talking about. We have the finish flag. We can configure these flags as well with dash dash scan flags. 
This way, we can um, trick the IDS or the firewall to think that our traffic is invalid and therefore it shouldn't raise alerts, right? Because the firewall job or the IDS job is not to correct the packets. Its a job is to inspect the packets and see if there is a match between the incoming packets, okay, and the signature of packets it has in the database. So it's not the job of IDS to detect invalid packets. At the end, the packets will reach the destination and will be assembled in the correct way. But the mission here or the goal is to prevent the IDS from recognizing the malicious packets. What is another tactic to evade IDS? Another tactic is related to changing or manipulating the payload, the data of the packet. So <clears throat> we have two tactics. The first one is base64 and the other one is <coughs> it's not going to be plus, it is and and we have URL encoding. This is very beneficial during two phases in the cyber kill chain. The first one is in the delivery and the other one is in data exfil. In both cases, netcard can be taken as an example. <coughs> Let's say I want to execute netcat lvnp to create a listener on port 1234. Okay, and then when the connection comes in, I want to execute slash bin slash bash. So I could execute this command, okay, on the attacker machine, okay, or it can be on the victim machine, where you go back to the attacker machine and connect to it. But what if the IDS is configured to inspect the content of the payload, the content of the connection, meaning it will block, to, uh, log, or uh, drop the connection if it figures out that the payload has slash bin bash or sometimes the IDS will be configured to inspect the packet data and alert or create an alert if the word ncat is mentioned in the packet in this case all of the methods we followed above about changing the protocols fragmentation the ports will not work because the IDS in this case, it is blocking or creating an alert based on the content of the payload. Yeah, you will pass the protocol and port aspects of your uh, packet, but at the end, when the IDS comes to the stage of inspecting the content of the payload, it will see NCAT or bin bash, and it's going to say, oh, this is not a good packet. It's going to create alert, or it's going to block if it was an IPS. So what to do in this case? In this case, we have to manipulate the content of the payload. We can do that using base64. So this command, and instead of executing it directly, we're gonna use base64 on this. But how to do this? Basically, we're going to, we can send this command, or we can store it in a file, name it um, cmd.txt. Okay, and then what we can, what we can do, on the command line, we can execute base 64 cmd.txt. This will be the, out the output here will be the uh, base 64 encoding of this command. Okay, now in the case of URL encoding, if you want to encode the command directly on your command line, you can use a tool called URL okay, encode. You can provide the same file or you can directly provide the command here as a command line argument. It will give you the URL in encoding of this command. And then you can take the output which is in page 64 or URL encoding and apply it directly. It will be recognized by the command line and hopefully the IDS will not be able to detect it. Now the last method we're going to talk about is encryption, which is the most effective method. 
to evade IDS or IPS. But how it works? In encryption, what we do here, we rely on the fact that an IDS will not have visibility over encrypted traffic. Okay, even the firewall, unless it's encrypted, unless it's configured to inspect the SSL traffic, in that case, it will have visibility over the internal traffic only by installing the certificates on the client machines or browsers. But as an attacker outside the network, every encrypted traffic you send to the target network will not be uh, will decrypted by the IDS. So we have to rely on this fact because it is um, definite and certain it will work. But how we will do that? In encryption, first we have to create a key, right? And then after creating the key, we're going to have to use an appropriate tool. It can be SOCAT. SOCAT can be used to create encrypted tunnels or encrypted connections between client and server, much like Netcat, but encrypted version. But how are we going to do that? We're going to have to rely on uh, certain tools. So to create a key, we can use OpenSSL. So in OpenSSL, we're going to create one certificate key. Okay. And we're going to create one private key. Now then, after we create the certificate and the private key, we need to combine them into what's called Privacy Enhanced Mail, P-E-M. After we have created the necessary parameters for an encrypted connection, we can now switch to SOCAT. In SOCAT, we can create a listener. Okay, so here we create a listener. And in the, in, the, in the command, we're going to specify the port and we're going to specify, remember, the PM file. And lastly, when the listener is ready, we can connect to the listener by specifying the port. Okay, but the role exchange here or the role play here will be like this. The listener will be on the uh, attacker machine good this is where you have the PM key right it's gonna be on your attacker machine and then on the victim machine you would write a socat command to connect to the listener and then you execute commands all the commands will be encrypted and you will not be noticed unless socat is prohibited on the target network. In that case, you would need to uh, base 64 or URL encode all of the all of the commands from the very beginning. How this looks like? Let's see here. So usually, let's see where it is. That's an example command. Okay. So here we create an RSA key 4096 and the certificate will expire after 365 days. It's better if you have a domain name. Usually the domain name will be the domain name you choose for your C2 server. So having a domain name is very helpful to create a certificate signing request. So with this SSL command, with this open SSL command, we can create a private key and a certificate file. And then after we do that, we can combine the private key and the certificate uh, file into one PM. And lastly, on the attacker machine, we can execute this command, so cat, remember to, as you can see, we use open SSL, listen, right? And this is the port we use for listening. And this is the PM file we created earlier. On the attacker machine now, all on the victim machine, we have to connect to the listener we have created earlier on the attacker machine. So at OpenSSL, and here we put the attacker IP on port and we execute bin bash. Now let's take an example where we demonstrate the evasion tactics. So the credit of this lab goes to TryHackMe. The room's name is Network Security Solutions. And we're going to use the lab material here. So we go to the browser and there is here, as you can see, guys, um, 
If you browse to the machine IP address on port 8080, you will see a space to enter your command. This looks very much like uh, a, a scenario or a stage in your cyber kill chain where you have found an entry point to execute system commands. So let's say you have found this entry point and now you would want to execute your commands. So the first thing you want is to get first foothold or delivery or you want to get the first access. So in this case, we can try or the, the proven scenario here is a bind shell. A bind shell is a shell where the listener is actually running on the victim machine. Okay, and then from the attacker's side, we connect to that listener and we start executing system commands. So the command laid down in this case, or in that scenario is here. So this is the command. This will create a listener on the victim machine. The listener will listen use or will use port 1234. And once a connection comes in, it will execute bin bash. So if we submit this command, okay, assumingly, the victim machine will start listening on incoming connections using port 1234. So if we submit this and we go to the command line and use this command, right? This is the victim IP and this is the port it's listening on. I should now get a connection, mean, meaning I should now be able to execute the same commands. If I enter this, as you can see, now connection is refused. So meaning there is either a firewall or an IPS blocking certain aspects of the connection. It could be the port, it could be the, uh, the, the payload data such as the word netcat could be blocked by the IDS. So I have to find a way or work around. So if we go back now to the tactics we have discussed, we have discussed many tactics here. Okay, Changing the source port, changing the protocol, um, fragmentation but remember that every tactic has pros and cons depending on the stage we are at here we are at the delivery stage we want to deliver a reverse shell or a bind shell so we want to use the appropriate tactic here so to deliver a successful bind shell or a reverse shell we can start or we can let's scroll down yeah we can rely on changing the source port so here going back to the scenario so instead of port 1234 for example i could use different ports i could use 53 or i could use 80 okay in the scenario here so going back to the box this is the command and instead of 1234 i would want to use a port that is allowed it could be 23 and now if I execute submit okay going back here this time I'm gonna use 23 and again connection refused so it is not the port it could also be that the port is blocked but I don't know for sure what I know for sure is that when I change the port to a regular allowed port telnet the command to work so I have to change the tactics so changing port didn't work. Okay, scrolling down. Fragmentation works for port scanning. Invalid packets works for port scanning. All right, what about encoding? What about if we encode the, the, the entire payload? Let's go to CyberChef. So here from paste 32, or to paste 32, I input the command, and then I get the output of paste 32. So we're gonna take this and execute the command here submit try to connect and again refused it could be that the base 32 wasn't recognized by the end uh, by the by the client end it could also be a reason we have to keep trying you can try base 64 from base oh to base 64 Okay, and we get the output, we go back. So we try base 64 instead. And now we connect. Connection refused, so it didn't work. Let's try URL encoding. 
URL encoding. So we URL encode this command. We take it. Let's try now. Again, refused. So, so far, none of the encoding methods worked. What we could do now, we could try to encrypt the entire connection using SOCAT. So we could go through the stages of generating a certificate file and a private key file. And then we would try to establish SOCAT on both the attacker and the victim. But this is not the case of this scenario. We are bound by the fact that it will only work using NETCAT. So we have to find a way to make NETCAT work. One of the proven methods is using a space in the command. Let's go back here. So this is the command, right? We're going to take the command as is, go back. And here we're going to input a space. Okay. So why are we doing this? Because clearly it is not something in the command that is making the connection to be dropped. Because if it was, then one of the encoding methods would have worked. We are changing the entire outlook of the payload. Still, it will, it's not working. So there is something that we could change to make this work. One of the things is to use a space between the end cut and the start of the parameters. If we submit now and we go back. And now, as you can see, it looks like we are having a connection. If we try to execute some commands like ID, and now we get the ID of the user, which is red team sec. So this method worked. And this will answer your question here. No, there are two answers. What does an IPS stand for? It's intrusion prevention. What do you call a system that can detect malicious activity, but not stop it? It is the detection system. Engine types. What kind of IDS engine has a database of all known malicious packets? It is a signature. What kind of IDS engine needs to be needs to learn what normal traffic? It's anomaly based. We we explained this and last one is signature based. All right, the rules. In the attached file, the logs show that a specific IP address, the log files. I'm gonna have to download this, I think. Let's go ahead and download the task files. Let's go ahead. Okay, let's see. In the attached file, the logs show that a specific IP address has been detected scanning our system of IP address 10.10.112.168. What is the IP address running the port scan? So if you go back to the attached file here, we can see there are several files here indicating different scans. If we check the first one, ICMB echo reply. Why does why this is the first one we cannot check? Because usually I Nmap scans uses ICMP. To determine if a host is live so we're going to take a look at this log file and we see an example log file created by an ids so i say ping scan this is the message that is created by the ids and that's the alert details as you can see this is the direction of the packet so it's originating from the host on the local network to the attacker IP address because it's an ICMP echo reply. It is telling the attacker that this host is live. So that is the attacker IP address, meaning this is the IP address used for the port scanning. Now, in the upcoming task, there is attached machine, but you will not need to launch the machine. I'm gonna tell you why while we answer the questions. We use the following Nmap scan. Okay, to launch a UDB scan against our target. So dash U for UDB. What is the option we need to add 
to set the source port to 161, it is dash dash G161. We explain this. The target allows Telnet traffic. Using netcat, how do we set a listener on the Telnet port? So the listener can be set with the following command. We already also explained this in the theoretical part. And we use port 23 because we want to trick the IDS into thinking that this is a regular Telnet traffic. We're scanning our target using nmap-ss stealth scan-f for IP fragmentation. We want to fragment the IP packets used in our nmap scan so that the data size does not exceed 16 bytes. In this case, we're going to use double F. Start the attack box and the attach machine. Consider the following three types of nmap scans. Which of the above three arguments would return meaningful results when scanning the machine IP? Okay, so I tried this. If you tried the null scan or the XMAS scan, the, uh, you will see zero results, null results. But if you try the finish scan, you will see the list of the ports in a filtered state. What is the option in HPing3 to set a custom TCP window size slash W? You can find the answer in the documentation or in the task uh, readings. Okay, using page 64 encoding, what is the transformation of cat etc password? Okay, we can use Cyberchef for that. Cyberchef. And with 2 page 64, this is your answer. The base, the base 32 encoding of a particular string is this. What is the original string? We're going to take this. Go back to cyber chef delete type page 32 from page 32 and this is your output using the provided open ssl command above meaning this command to create a key as we explained earlier you create a certificate which we gave the extension crt and a private key which we gave the extension key what is the first line in the certificate file it is begun certificate just execute the command and you will create the crt and the key file open them using a text editor and you will see the first line and the last line protocols used in proxy servers can be http https sox4 sox5 which protocols are currently supported by nmap sox4 and the rest of the tasks are this one can you find it in the readings and that sums it up guys that's it for today's video you have now the answers for this room and i'm gonna see you later